Hi, here's Florian with a new podcast guest. So introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Martin Vesovsky. I am a chief designer and futurist at SAP. And we are here in Berlin, uh, which is a great city to future around in. Yes, definitely. Um, so Martin, how did you get your position in SAP? Well, I guess uh, it's less about the position, more about what we do here. Um, so I've been working with design for a very long time uh, through other corporations, Sony and Huawei to start with. Um, before that, I did. Uh, I have a strong interest in media and technologies coming together from music because I played music a long time. And in the end, computers allowed you to record music. Cameras allowed you to be a photographer, which I also did for a while. And you could discover on your own how to express yourself through through these technologies. For example, through art or through through designs. So I started to work with designs. But then if you look at designs, they always express something to be. Hey, should we design this interface? This interface will exist in, I don't know, two weeks from now. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's in the future. Should we design a new product, a service, a system maybe that will exist maybe longer from now, one year from now? Okay, that's also in the future. So in the end, I realized that you know, also with the advent of um, what Apple did for, for the whole technology industry, they said, you design something meaningful for people. Design is a strategic endeavor, yeah. strategic activity. So if that is strategic, what are your visions? And then I realized you design futures. If they are two weeks from now or 20 years from now, you, they are still designable. So with that background, I moved to Huawei where I worked with strategies more than designs. Hands on the side, I left that. And I left it also because I realized that the design community sometimes could be very conservative in the way that I am here, I am a designer, so I design a product, a cer certain solution for this, but not thinking systemically about it. We were looking for the next big thing rather than understanding the next big thing is a relationship between many things that play this music, this jazz together, uh, sometimes incompatible things. Uh, and they come together. So it's a systemic design. So I left that and moved to SAP, which is in a systemic company. Yeah. And we act on a global scale with systems that make people work better. The quality time of work is a system. Yeah. And that was much more interesting. So started to work with products here, then uh, work with the design team as well to see how systemic we can be there. And then moved on to the... Uh, Innovation Center Network uh, in Potsdam to look at what would be SAP's vision. Uh, so looking far ahead from rather the strategy of the known to visions of the unknown. And this is where the chief designer is still there, but the futurist role helps us to help me to craft and propose possible futures that we actually think uh, humans at work, people at work, Uh, should have and we, we're following our big motto which is you know improving people's lives and making this world run better which is an abstract yeah. which you always can try to achieve so so that's my job yeah so out of your experience um, if you have a, a nice vision for the future and you say we should go in this direction um What are the best ways to, to make it happen on the ground, to make the next steps, the small steps into this direction? Well, um, I think actually that question is fairly well understood, how to execute on something. Uh, we love our strategies because we're good at it. We have had strategies for a long time. So we started to develop more faster methods, that, that, that we call them agile methods maybe, yeah. um, to put the, the, the ideas into the ground. Uh, so validate your ideas. You have a problem. You have a given problem. Yeah. You try to understand how to solve. Is this the right problem? You diverge, then converge. And this is the design thinking, the innovation method from Stanford that comes in. And this is great. And we utilize it since a decade back here at SAP. Many people do as well. You validate and you incubate these ideas with other people, your, your customers, your partners, yeah. as we do. <clears throat> and then you try to scale them if they seem to fly. This is, this is the right solution. And that's great. And many people think that this is the innovation. 
especially from a startup community, validate, incubate, scale, yeah. go fast, and so on. And I think it's a great movement that's yeah. been around for a while. Um, and many big corporations like, like ourselves and our customers sometimes look at it as the only way to innovate. For me, this is the incremental innovation. I call it the operations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your daily job, your every day, is business as usual. That means incremental innovation. You should always move forward a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and that's your executing on your strategy, validate, incubate, scale. But uh, already at Sony, I was thinking, okay, here's the strategy for the new Cybershot camera phone. We yeah. didn't have it. The iPhone didn't exist. Now we want to have it. We think it's a meaningful idea. Yeah, so make a strategy for that. I said, okay, what would that strategy build on? We can validate that proposition. We think this is lacking on the market for in human lives. That's a given question, and we're looking for answers to this question. We could validate incubate scale. But what do we build the strategy on? And this is where we went back. Here at SAP, we developed something that I think is unique. At least it must be pretty special because I have not seen it in many other uh, um, um, other forums. Um, what comes before strategy? And this is where we work with visions and this is where we explore. So first we do this. We observe objectively what's mm. happening out there. And I guess your listeners do too because you're interested in this podcast, which is great. <laughs> you observe the... I don't know, blockchain is happening. Yeah. Globalization is happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, this latest drone can do this and this. Yeah. Um, AI algorithms in machine learning specifically can now see things, hear things, understand things. Great. Yeah. It's not you, but it's out there. So you put it on your map. We call it the future fabric. First okay. exercise. Yeah. Second exercise to, to, to put your innovations in the ground, coming back to your original question, yeah. is to, okay... If this is objectively out there and you need to really follow the trends, you need to spend time with it. So that's a tip. <laughs> Put your people, your colleagues to that work, invest money in this. And this is very relatively, very cheap to do. Mm-hmm. Huh? The next exercise is connect these dots to narratives. Okay. If globalization is happening, blockchain is a distributed system of, of trust and people are more educated nowadays and have ideas to start up more than, say, 20 years ago. How can, will they use this, say, for example, in financial transactions or value exchange um, on an individual level rather than institutional level? Okay, that's a good question. Here's a scenario that could answer mm-hmm. that question. Yeah? They will be more autonomous, for example. And you do these narratives. We call them possible futures. Yeah. There are many. Yeah. Um, and there is a part of possible future studies, uh, uh, desirable and undesirable. Then you stick your head out a little bit more and you'll be more subjective. You choose the desirable ones. These futures, you then scrutinize and say, hmm, interesting futures. That's a long list. What would be the short list? Basically, next exercise, which is your strategic point of view. We call it like that. Yeah. What futures will we play a significant and positive role in bringing to the market? Yeah. And then Now you have a short list. Yeah. Then you build a strategy how to go to market. Then, first then, you have a strategy so you can validate incubate scale. Yeah. So that's our, our system. We call it innovation curation. That's what we do at SAP. Yeah, interesting. It's it's quite a huge challenge because like uh, to uh, to build possible futures is like it's it's typical sci-fi like the or desirable futures, desirable right? futures. Yeah. and um, that's so fascinating about like uh, like any sci-fi books movies um, and the the Netflix show um, Black Mirror it's always futures which has some good things and some bad things in it so uh, it's probably pretty hard to built a desirable future which has only good things in it Mm -hmm. so do you take this in account the the pro and cons of your of your futures yes um, absolutely you know in a way uh, half of the job is done uh, because all the dystopian futures are already uh, articulated people already know how it would be if robots would eat us alive, yeah? Yeah. as I usually say. Uh, because Hollywood have done that job for us. Yeah. 
they also have the enormous budgets to make it really well, yeah. to articulate it in fantastic, almost real experiences. Oh, this is how the future would look yeah. like if it was really shit. Yeah. So our job is the other part. So that's done. Yeah. We know how it would look. What we don't want, great. Yeah. Hey, you bootstrapped our thinking here. Let's do the opposite. Yeah. Let's do the ones that we actually would like to have because the thresholds, the threats and the sort of dangers are already described so now we can sort of avoid them and that's easier if it's already articulated and focus on the desirable yeah um i usually say that you know if you aim for the utopia um at least as a direction this is what we would love to have this is impossible and it's our dream it's our imagination imagination is very important for for uh, your visioning work in your enterprises uh, we imagine that this would be great. It's a an utopia. And in between this dystopia and utopia is something we call dutopia. Okay. So you design, deliver, you discuss, yeah. you, you do all these things to make this fantastic future happen. And that belongs also in the innovation curation exercises. So we focus on the great. Yeah. Cool. Sounds really interesting. Did you publish uh, the research there or your work there or is it more internally for SAP? Well, uh, no, uh, we don't, I don't have time. Okay. <laughs> I would love to because I really would like, like to know, are we the only ones that actually made a full um, system, a map of how to map these futures, the curation map, the innovation curation? It can't be so we are only ones that want to achieve these desirable exactly. futures yeah. and follow our vision of improving people's lives and make this world run better. And from that, we go deeper down and say, hey, uh, we make systems for people. They need to get better. Yeah. End of story. Always. Yeah. Incrementally, adjacent with the second horizon of innovation. And in the third horizon, we imagine the new, totally new. And the totally new, say, 10 years from now, would be... We say, for example, it could be a empathic symbiosis between machine intelligence and human ingenuity. Yeah. Ah, okay, so we understand what machines uh, can help us with. And machines understand the machine intelligence in your enterprise, have a notion of what your ambitions, business ambitions are, yeah. business outcomes. Yeah. From there, we trickle down to, hey, we have technology. We have platforms that can serve you to consume whatever you want to build on them, applications. The semantic knowledge of, we are an enterprise, we are BMW, we are um, uh, Henkel, we are BS, uh, BSF. We want to build these innovations on it. Yeah. We want business outcomes. Yeah. We also want to improve people's lives. We want to be protagonists in our innovation narrative. And this is where SAP trickles down that, that vision through our innovation vision, the symbiosis between machine intelligence to our strategy, uh, business technology platform, the business value for you, so you can be the protagonist, the hero in your story. And that work is extremely consuming in time and yeah. absolutely super fun. Yeah. Uh, and we are in the midst of transforming, as always. So publishing these methods and so on would be a little bit too much to do. But I would love to test it. We test it with our customers. Yeah. And many of them are absolutely amazed that we do have that method and yeah. they love to be there. Yeah. But yeah, you're probably right. I mean, I guess now I published it through your, uh, through your channel here. So let's see what people say. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But we'll also see in more in detail what, what you came out, what results of it. Methods yeah. are really cool. Methods are really important. Yeah. But it's also interesting to see what came out of it. Like that's what I'm mainly missing in politics. You know, they have a huge part of our future because they can say they can make rules for our society where you want it where we want to be and where we don't want to be but i have the feeling that they, they, they don't talk enough about it they don't think about it in it where we want to be in five to ten and twenty fifty years as society just say something about like yeah today is death and death. but that's not so interesting like what what will be there in five years and the same for the companies like it's all part of the society companies as well which build our surroundings and run our surroundings and yeah it could be an effect that if you publish that maybe you find uh, allies mm -hmm. and then maybe you're together together more effective because it's it seems like that like the the corporations between industries happens more and more 
because it it makes sense it makes sense to 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 get help from outside to to cooperate to like to make together something new you couldn't do before alone so yeah we will see yes <laughs> so for you as a futurist which technology impressed you the most in your lifetime well i guess it is You know, I'm, I'm Generation X. I'm 48. So I have the fantastic advantage, <coughs> and maybe the last generation that has it, uh, to have seen the analog world and lived in it and used it. Yeah. And I played music for many years, which was back then an analog activity. Yeah. Um, and that moved to a digital activity. So for me, the personal computer, um, my Mac, and the internet connection with it was absolutely game-changing. And I don't think I'm you know, breaking in some, some new doors here. Um, internet and the connection and democratization of that knowledge and the democratization of the power, when you know, it almost became humanly possible to put your art and then fiddle around with it in a time frame and in an idea world that is was reserved for experts and specialists and very rich people. Yeah. And you could do, uh, you could do it in, in, in your, in your home environment and in a band without money, that was fantastic. That was absolutely revolutionary because it democratized human ingenuity and the drive and experimentation forward. And that was the biggest change for me. Yeah. Makes definitely sense. And uh, we still get run by the internet and this yeah, will probably well. not go away. So, um, If we talk about like potential futures, mm -hmm. um, would you say we should be rather excited about our the coming future, or rather be scared uh, about the coming future? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question, and I get this a lot. Yeah, and I think we should maybe keep that question, but always rephrase it. Um, if you have, if you plan a party on Friday, it's in the future. Should we be scared of that party? It depends which people you invite. <laughs> exactly. Now we're talking. Now we're going to the Dutopia. So you need to make this party happen. Yeah? And I guess in German it's almost better. You, you, you actually make it. Yeah? <laughs> but, but imagine like that if you don't invite your people, but other people do. So that's what I'm saying. You, you create the future. So you are the active part in making this future. You take small and big decisions for these futures to happen. Now, what we need to do is start to sit down and be the fusionists, basically fuse our ideas together. So discussion must happen. Great, we know how to discuss. It's no black magic. Yeah. Put, put the people you want to discuss. Call them up. Yeah. Send them an email. Hey, guys, we, I'm, I'm thinking of this. Um, plan the fantastic futures and tell this is a great ideas. The obstacles will hit us in the face anyway. Yeah. Right, <laughs> that's that's a yeah. given. Oh shit, we don't. This is expensive. People don't understand this. The other people will invite them as well. Right? Now you're talking about the future that you actually would like to have. You invite the right people to that party. You put the ideas on that table so you have a decent, informed, and passionate discussions about this. And you still keep the vision, the fantastic party, fantastic future on the map. This is the curation map. Yeah. So. Uh, we should be absolutely positive, curious, and experimental about the futures. Um, we should also know what could go wrong. Mm. That's for sure. But being scared as a default, it's a downward spiral that will kill us. Fortunately, we have been living towards a future since yeah, beginning of man. Exactly. <laughs> Human. So it seems that we're doing something right. We always end, end up in better futures than before in yeah. almost all aspects yeah. of, of life. Yeah. And there are great books about it. Um, so I'm not afraid that we are aiming for something good. I'm also very positive that whatever comes our way that is an obstacle, we seem to gather together and try to overcome it. So yes, let's be absolutely positive and excited about the futures. That's the only way to be. So if you invite to your next party, well, don't be scared of it because you are the protagonist in that innovation story. Let's, let's stick a bit to this party metaphor because I, I like it. Um, for example, a friend in the old, old times, he had to travel like they, they invited friends and then 
other friends invited also friends and friends and friends. <laughs> and at the end, you had a huge party, which was probably the biggest party in town. Yeah. But he had also a lot of people there which were not directly connected to my friend. Yeah. And they didn't care about the flat. Mm -hmm. So they did a lot of stupid things. They need to kick them out and so on. And to put this back to, the, to our topic, um, one of the issues I see is um, that Google, like, they don't really care so much about what Germany, what German government, what German people think. And I also have sometimes a feeling uh, Silicon Valley likes to do stuff because just it's possible. They just do everything which is possible and believe in it that technology will make our world better, which it clearly did, did until now. And even if they say, yeah, we, we care about your, uh, about your data security and your data privacy, if you look in the, in, the, in the settings of Facebook and Google for your data privacy, it's like, sure, there is something. If you know exactly where it is and what you want to do with it, you're fine. For any other person, it's just, you know, just as a, as a trick there. You, know, just, you could do it if, you, if you're smart enough and if you want enough, but everybody else, we run a party. Well, it, it comes back to, to the discussion about technology. Um, we all know that technology uh, wants nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in a way, at the same time, uh, something's on inevitable. We will communicate more. We love to com communicate. Yeah. That will happen. Yeah. Now, technology will help us to communicate more. Just yeah. an example of things that will happen. Yeah. And we've seen that so... Uh, take the communication devices like an iPhone, a smartphone, it was bound to happen. Who would make it and predicting, oh, it, I knew it would be Apple. That's not really true. You didn't. But what you could sense that we would communicate more technology would help us. So technology will follow the in inevitable human desire to, uh, for convenience, for communication, yep. for understanding and so on. Um, so technology is not evil. Technology is nothing of it. But the society has a drive, an urge, a passion, a wish. So it's not the technology uh, that gives us opportunities and, and, and uh, threats maybe even. It's the social, the human imagination. Um, so the future of humans is a social discussion, not a technology yeah. discussion. Yeah. Also, it's not a national discussion only. It's a global discussion. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, if Bulgaria have an idea about how the future should look, Bulgaria or Poland or Vietnam or US, or we can go on forever just yeah. to make it <laughs> clear here, yeah. yeah, is a part of a larger social uh, entity. Our job is to orchestrate and conduct like a piece of music. Where are we headed? But it is a piece of improvisational music. We need to experiment and discuss this very clearly. So we need to articulate our positions, coming back to, for example, social movements forward. What is the future of Europe, Asia, the continents, the globe? How would we like to live 2037? Where is that paper, that articulation? Where is that, where is that movie? Yeah? I mean, SAP have articulated the uh, symbiosis, the empathic symbiosis yeah. between machine intelligence and human ingenuity. It's a very large abstract, but we put it down. We know the ingredients needed. We know that, for example, automation will help people to run better. Yeah. Uh, autonomy between business. You mentioned the businesses talk to other businesses. Yeah. Well, that's exactly like countries talk to other countries, people to other people. Yeah. The autonomy of transactional uh, value exchange between ecosystems of ecosystems. You see, this is global, culture, business-like, doesn't matter, yeah? It's another A we put on that map in this articulation. Yes. Then we thought, oh, wait a second, humans always urge, it's inevitable, to be more augmented. We buy glasses, we use maps, yeah. <laughs> we augment ourselves with knowledge. Yeah. Humans will be more augmented. So augmentation will play a role, the third A. Yes. Then we said, there are the economies of the world move towards abundance. One example that is uh, emerging, and it seems to be true, that energy is getting cheaper and cheaper. We can perhaps solve almost totally, almost for free, uh, give energy to the world uh, through solar uh, panel advances and so on. We can go on forever. 
Well, that's abundance economy. It's not like I have, you don't, I sell. It's more I have this, you have this. How can we complete and be mm. complementary, complementary yeah. to each other? Again, coming back, oh, wait a second, that plays together with the autonomy of our businesses. So we built this technology platform, not for the technology, for the business outcomes, the symbiosis between our ingenuity to leverage our human value. We want to create higher value outcomes of knowledge work, building on the help that the business outcomes would have through machine intelligence. So we don't do the mundane work, we do the high value work. And that's our dream. So we articulated that clearly to the market, to us. We made that manifesto. Now we're trying to execute on that manifesto, which is hard. Mm. We need to conduct and orchestrate and fuse the ideas. I wish that this discussion came back to also social discussions, yeah. political discussion, economical yeah. and financial institutes. How can we great, uh, greatly build that futures together? So I guess it, it comes back to that. Yes, it's a social party we're coming to. And on Friday, we, we will get this together, at least as a nice prototype. And then we will move yeah. forward. But build that manifesto for yourself compared to others. And then we have something going on. And then you have directly the understanding if you can do something together or not. Because the manifesto is clearly, if it fits on which parts, you know exactly. Change your manifesto. Yes, exactly. Listen to others. Other people will invite other people, right? Yeah. Good. Then you have to ask your, the question, hey, um, who do I know? How can I trust these people, friends, that they invite the right people for this party? Yeah. Because there is nothing like the right people, the wrong people. There are right people to solve this problem, that idea, that business intention you have. You have the technology platform in, in the background. This is what we're providing, for example. I'm talking SAP, but you can just imagine what you yeah. can contribute with. Yeah. Hey, there's the business outcome. Here's the party outcome. Who would like, you know, you build relationships. The rest will follow. You design relationships. The rest will follow. Our customers want to have relationships with, the, with their employees, yeah. with their brand, Yeah. With their products and services, they want this experience management to be there. And this is what you do privately as well. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you invited these 10 friends and she will invite th her friends because you trust her. Yeah. You build a relationship of trust. You have this experience management socially as much as we want to have this whole category of experience management. I, actually, we bought a whole company that is leadership, Qualtrics, mm -hmm. uh, in, in experience management. Can you imagine? SAP realized through our vision to improve, we need coherent, computer-aided, if you wish, machine intelligence-aided, human ingenuity building on relationship management. Mm. Relationship building. We call it experience management. So we bought that as an ingredient to that. How about bringing that to the other spheres, to your party, right? Yeah. How can you be mm. their active figure Uh, to bringing your innovation idea, managing the experience, managing the outcomes of why you bringing people to that party, to that brand, to that product mm. and service. Yeah, there's, a, there's also a lot going on. There's also like a startup in Berlin which uh, analyzes uh, mm. team culture behavior. They're called Munch AI. Okay. Um, so what they do is um, they try to analyze your communication in your team to estimate what you can do better to build a stronger culture, a stronger team culture. But it's a different topic. Um, what I sometimes or mostly always ask myself, if you say, sure, it's about the people, it's about their, their goals and uh, being together and like living together in a social world. Um, I have sometimes the feeling that people are not self-aware enough what's going on. Like if you look sometimes in a, in a street or in a tram, everyone looking down at their phone, like everyone. And I think, okay, if you want to do that and you have the need to, to get this news or whatever, or to text with this person, are you aware of that, that you do this this much time? Or you're just following the, the, little, the little carrot because it's what you initially want to. What do you think about that? Uh, it's a great observ observation. Uh, For, for us, at least, we, of course, have a philosophy about this, a vision and a strategy. Okay. <laughs> yes, no, no. sorry about that. But we, 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 we've been thinking sorry. a lot. We've been thinking. That's our job here. Uh, I mean, we need to realize that SAP touches uh, between 70 and 80 percent of the world uh, value transactions. We have 400,000 customers. 
uh, we want to do good and be yeah. good. We really are uh, passionate about improving people's lives. Although that's an abstract, it is a guiding star. Yeah. We really want these business outcomes be the main a tool, not only the technology platform. It only builds on that technology platform. And that must be excellent because we are good in software. It just happened to be so, but we want to improve people's lives. Now, back to your question. So that's the philosophy, right? And if you look, how can we manage experiences? How can we lead this? We will lead this category of, of business outcomes. Manage your experience with your brand. This is building relationships to your consumers. This is people. Yeah. This is observation. This is a relationship. Tell me how you feel yeah. about this and this and this. That's mm. observation, right? Yeah. Now now we're coming down and down, down from this yeah. big picture to... <clears throat> I think this is our way to say whether you think from business, which we do, yeah. usually enterprise business, small, big, or, or you know, enormous, we want to give you the ability to listen to each other. Also, listen to yourself. How are we feeling? Your employees, your team, which goes back to listen to yourself. How am I feeling in this situation? For that, you also see, and this is not uh, a surprise, and we studied that on our future fabric, bringing us back to the beginning of the podcast, mm-hmm. um, to a trend that is a, almost like a movement. We are back to the idea that we need to listen actively inside and outside. Ask more questions than you, uh, sorry, uh, let people talk more and ask questions and listen more than you give answers. Yeah. Uh, this is where actually the mindfulness business is uh, coming into to, uh, high level schools, to Harvard, to IMD, to, to all, to Duke. Uh, this is where you bring um, mindfulness as an idea of listening into your businesses. It's a daily practice in many parts of SAP and other uh, startup communities, obviously. People actually don't have to have a formal mindfulness program in your enterprise. They already practice this. Yeah. It's uh, almost like not only a generational shift, it's a social shift. But mindfulness is not only a business practice or a self-awareness s- s- sort of a movement. It is a human practice. And I think back to your question, how can we belong how can we have a decent discussion? How, how can I tell you what I think, what I'm passionate about? For example, I want to have a sustainable su- supply chain and I work for a big company in shipping. Well, who am I to promote my idea to you? Well, I need to first ask myself. That's self-listening. This is our brand. This is, I am maybe the CEO and she's sitting in her office I have this passion. I really want this to happen. But who am I? Why? Why me as a person? Should we change the CEO? Should I ask my staff? What do they think? My customers. Guys, we've been meeting like 20 times the last month. How am I to you? Can I be the leader to be the sustainable, um, positive driver for for the planet and still make the supply chain and the logistical to improve people's life? Be the protagonist in it. That requires self-knowledge, self-understanding, without being, you know, too uh, Aristotle about it. It's, in the end, common sense. So back to the original question, yeah, maybe, maybe you should put your paper and pen and book or phone or whatever you're consuming mindlessly sometimes uh, down and just listen. How do I feel about it? How do you feel about it? How can we get this back to conduct, orchestrate, and fuse these ideas, that discussion? How can we manage these experiences? So experience management is coming. So we focus on the business outcomes or social outcomes yeah. with the technology's help, the machine intelligence and the human ingenuity coming back together. Yes, listen more. I have another question. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a festival called, a future festival of young young people called Z2X. Mm-hmm. And what they said, which was really interesting, there was a, a person on the stage which asked the audience, uh, which of you studied or at least your parents studied? And like close to all the arms went up in the air. And he said, listen, guys, we come together here to talk about 
the future and to discuss and learn. But you know what? We are here in a bubble. Like we 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 put out a certain a lot of people around it which are also interested in the future or like at least influenced in the future, but they are not part of the discussion right now or not part of this of this movement of this idea. So and I was thinking about it and he said, Yeah, he's right. Like this is a huge problem that like highly educated people, studied people, they think a lot about it, but they are in a bubble because how many people you know which which are not studied and uh, get hard fear and don't have a job. And what what's your what's your thinking about that? How do you reach these people? How do you take these people as well in a better future and like probably also listen to them and um, know what they feel and understand them? It's 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 maybe the uh, the question of our times, uh, especially now. Um, if we look from back, back, so back to the future, <laughs> back cast a little bit. Um, first, we have one movement, uh, and back to the facts. This world is a better place to live in, in many, many, most of the aspects. For example, we are more educated than before. Uh, you can don't have to look back far to see enormous differences in yeah. education. Yeah. Uh, that comes from another positive drive and, and a trend and something that is happening to this planet, education or learning, knowledge, is more available than ever. Yeah? To actually even the poorest uh, people on this planet. Um, of course, this is gradually increasing, yeah. but it's also exponentially increasing with the uh, advent of readily available technologies and information everywhere. Yeah. Uh, it would be unheard of for a person that knows someone with a smartphone, that knows someone that can gather a, a group of people, youngsters somewhere in Vietnam. Of course, not everybody has one, but maybe one in ten, rather than like here, we have two each, yeah. <laughs> uh, has that phone, can open the YouTube channel because there is someone with a Wi-Fi connection somewhere that can, they can borrow and look up what the hell is quantum mechanics really. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and they can be amazed and do not understand what that is. They can see how to and what if and so on and get new and gather around that. That was unheard of. Quantum mechanics was reserved for a tiny little bubble of people just 30 years ago, just 20 years ago. Yeah. Not even speaking 200 years ago. So that's one trend. We are healthier. We live longer. We are less violent. We are safer. Uh, we are uh, healthier, which means that also we eat better because we can produce all these things. That's one. Yeah. Second, there is a movement where we see the connection of people. I don't remember the numbers exactly, but it took us like, it took us the whole Homo sapiens history to connect, what is it now, 3.8 billion people to at this, this kind of opportunity uh, through internet and, and other places. Okay? mobility, globalization, and so on. It's cheaper to travel. Since people are getting richer, in general, uh, much richer, actually, the middle class is rising, more people can travel and connect to Inter. Yeah. So, okay, the, these things go together, and they infuse each other. Which means that the next three billion connected to Internet will not take a Homo sapiens history. Yeah. <laughs> it will not take 100,000 years. Yeah. It will take five. Yeah. Which means that these people will be in the discussion. They will have a voice out there. How they will have that voice, and I mean, this, if this is 10 years from now, everybody will be more or less connected. Have the ability to study something, or learn something, or have an opinion, mm -hmm. or contribute with that opinion, publish mm -hmm. it. What will we do the next 10 years? How will we do uh, during this shift, this valley, this sort of this unknown when we realize the future is exponential. We sort of realized this the last 20 years and now hitting is, this is hitting in our faces and we are very, oh, pop, 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 wait a second. Technology will again kill us and, and let's go back in, in, into the past and let's pull the brakes. Well, it's quite a human reaction. Coming back to the optimism and the passion for desirable futures. Why would we invite something to a scary party? Yeah. Someone to a scary. Let's 
again, articulate what we want, have a decent discussion about it. And as you said, invite everybody as long, you know, as soon as they are able to be in that, let's make it happen for them. Let's make them to be protagonists in their innovation or human story that make these technologies available. You know, as, as, as we, they usually say, the future is already here, but it's not evenly distributed. What, how can you conduct, fuse and, and, and orchestrate so that future is distributed to others? I mean, SAP, for example, is having a program where we uh, said, OK, can we affect one billion lives, which would be a little bit uh, the, the same discussion everywhere. Can we make this bubble but very yeah. big? What are the startups out there? They are undeserved, underserved, I should say. Mm -hmm. Are they uh, minorities out there that are super innovative? Yeah. Are there uh, women in Africa that try to innovate yeah. for their um, everyday life? There are great innovators. doesn't have to be technological. Yeah. It can be social innovators. Yeah. Yes. Can we be VCs for them? Yeah. You know, generally speaking. Yeah. Can we invest in them? Because investing in Silicon Valley is easy. Yeah. Um, investing in, in the underinvested is harder. So we're trying yeah. to do that as well. We try to, for example, we have a great program that I personally am super, super curious about and I love. And it's been uh, internationally uh, observed. We call it Autism at Work. Okay. So, you know, uh, we think we have our bubble and being like me, that's the normal way of being. Okay, yeah. obviously that's a subjective bubble. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but everyone thinks that. Everyone, everyone thinks, thinks that. Everyone thinks themselves as normal, so all, you always think that like the everyone person is quite yeah. similar to you. That's we, like your first... And we realized it from this perspective that, hey guys, we, ha we have a lot of artists at work. Our colleagues are uh, autistic colleagues. How can we first realize that we have autism at work? This is where the title is so great. We have autism at work. Hey, can we deduct it? Can we discover that? And, and the second, what is the opportunity putting autism at work, to work? How can these colleague, autistic colleagues you know, outshine in their own abilities as I can do in my own abilities? Yeah. And so we put that program to work and it, it's a great success. Just a couple of examples how we bring this discussion in and, and make our bubble more a global bu bubble, yeah. the one bubble. Yeah. Cool. Also, what what came to my mind is um, you said, that, yeah, we want to bring the rest of the people to the party, which don't have so good mm -hmm. the connection and so on. And my first, my first thinking was um, if their voice really matters because right now it's like power is there where the money is at least it seems like that but on the other side you could also argue that like probably knowledge or like into human intuity human intelligence will probably win on the long term especially if we say i think that's that's a fair conclusion we can take Uh, out of the last five minutes yes. because right now this is definitely like that money is uh, power is there where the money is but how you said you know especially SAP things for example about how we can invest in this part because they have something we don't have or they they, they can bring something to the table and if you go back to if, if we fail in the mindfulness maybe they bring the mindfulness to the table because they still have the analog world before them and they can take preserve the mindfulness out of there and bring it to the digital world. Um, so you think a lot and you, you, you try to um, build new utopias. How do you gain your knowledge? Like, how do you educate yourself? Um, I try to um, change my context as soon as possible, as, as often as possible. Uh, what I mean by that is meet other people, do the same stuff, but in a new environment, um, be in the same environment, but, but do new stuff. <laughs> you know, as they say, get a hobby and carry on. Um, I try to be diverse in my thinking and I'm trying to do that because it's very, very hard. We love what we love. That's the bias. <laughs> we are good at things we are already good at. So we pursue to be even better. Exactly. Um, I don't know who said it, but I love it. You cannot see new things if you're looking harder in the same direction. Yeah. And I love that saying because it's, oh shit, I'm looking in the same direction again. I just, this is super exciting. I think I discovered something new. No, it's the same, but just slightly different. So I'm trying too hard to, you know, 
reset and hack myself by visiting new places, uh, having new discussions, listening more, uh, uh, listening to myself and wait, wait, am I saying the same thing again? Well, maybe it's because I, it, I'm passionate about it. I should say it again. Yeah. Like like several things in this podcast because I discovered that they would be valuable. Yeah. Now, can I sit down and listen to your opinion? Ah, that's harder. Damn it. Let's try. So this is how I challenge myself. I think um, the business is outside us. And, and actually you as a listener can maybe help me or at least help you to start with to practice this change of context. Look for change. Change is your design brief. What is changing is maybe the biggest inspiration for what should be out there because then you can derive of what is not changing. For example, human convenience. Mm. We want the lives to be easier. What does that mean? Well, observe that. Don't assume that you have the answer and say, Ah, it's basically because we want to have a higher value of our output. I want to write a better book. I want to uh, repair a bicycle a little bit quicker because we want to bicycle together. Yeah. I want to make it cheaper because in our village, bicycles are very useful for what we're doing. How can I look in new directions to make that better? Who can help me? And in our business, you need to cha challenge yourselves If you are in an ecosystem in, uh, for example, well, shipping, as we had before, logistics and supply chain, how do you listen to your customers? What is their experience? Hey, what is the experience of your employees? How do people look at your brand, at your products? Listen to them. So change the context to their context or change the business. If you're in logistics, are you in space exploration? Oh, wait a second. We're running, uh, we're running drones here. We are super cutting edge uh, startup. Hmm. Can we help the you know, industrialization of space? Is that happening, by the way? That's a new thought. Are we in that business in five years from now? Are we relevant in that? Who should we ask? Again, look for that change. Look from what you still want to achieve, but a little bit better. What does, does not change? Look for new contexts. So ask new people. So I'm trying to be out there and actually inform myself and with that SAP to improve people's lives from outside in. From the inside out, I assume you guys are great in doing what you're doing, usually. But changing the concept, context from outside in is harder. So I'm looking for change. Interesting. And... It sounds also that you said like you want to have always change around you, also in like in, in your office and in your daily life. And what else are um, strategies you're using next to travel to accomplish that? Because it's quite hard. Like people don't in in their nature don't like change. Mm -hmm. Normally they like more stability consistently because change uh, means it's more energy draining uh, training to concentrate and to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So what else for strategies you're using to to make this change happening in your daily life? Mm, good question. Um, I don't have a simple answer, but I have at least a a guiding star. You said stability. Mm -hmm. um, The opposite to stability for, for many folks out there, and, and correct me, listeners, if you, if you agree or have another opinion, the immediate sort of spontaneous answer, what's the opposite to stability? Well, that's instability. Okay, that's simple. That's true. Um, if you prolong that, well, that's chaos. Yeah? Yeah. And we have chaos theories, and sometimes we let the net network, let the people have, have, have a say, so leave it to the jazz of the people. So the opposite to stability is instability. Now, since future is uh, happening and you want to be stable because that's safe, you have your business model, for example. So you craft your business outcomes on continuous stability. You want to repeat results, uh, scale efficiently. But if you listen to the word repeat results, it's the diagonal opposite of innovation. Yeah. If you repeat what you have done, you will get what you have got. Yeah. Okay. Now... I believe differently. The opposite to stability is not instability. It's emergence. It's evolution. The next stepping stone uh, is if you follow your rigorous plan, well, you will end up where you planned. But the, the world might have moved in a different direction. So you will be somewhere else when you should have been. 
Yeah? Yeah. So observe emergence and be happy and comfortable with change. Try that. Love change. Embrace change. Yeah? And that's, that's uncomfortable. For example, mountain biking can hurt, yeah. but it's super fun. Yeah. <laughs> and the feeling afterwards is I experienced something new. It was a little bit scary, but absolutely exhilarating. Okay. Yeah. And this is a little bit going into this transformative innovation. It doesn't have to be disruptive. Transformative is much better. Through the idea of look for emergence. What is emerging? If I move in this direction, oh, new stepping stones, new business opportunities emerge because I moved. Don't plan for them. To, you cannot predict the future, but you can move towards a direction. So again, build your utopia. Build your vision to start yeah. with. And try to find your utopia, your strategic point of view, where you want to be. And go with it. Go with its emergence. The stability is you walking forward. Or at least at moving. Maybe you step backwards sometimes because you learn something from your mistakes. But with that learning, new emergent insights come. Yeah. And you can move again. Hopefully this time forward. So the movement, the constant change, is the stability of today. And that's the philosophy I'm looking for. Yeah, interesting. Out of my experience, uh, if, if I, I, I want to build on that, is uh, if we say a change is always connected to unstability and fear, you can always listen into yourself for fear. And normally what you fear the most This is the new thing you should do the fastest immediately. So this is, can be also a guidance just to, how you said, don't be afraid. Um, to always listen for a fear. And if the fear coming up, be aware of it and then tackle it. Because the same like mountain biking, you are, you are feared of like going down this mountain because it can hurt. But if you if you tackle it and you accomplish it, you feel much more better. The same is with fear. If you uh, come over the fear and you did it anyway, mm -hmm. you will feel much better. So my second last question is, uh, what are your favorite books? Yeah, actually, uh, there are several that I liked. Well, lately, it's, it's across a couple of years lately. Uh, so... For example, I'm reading right now a history of Western philosophy, Mr. Russell. Uh, the reason is that the idea of thought, the history of, of ideas, if you wish, about why we're here, uh, this is a form of listening, yeah? it's, very, it's getting more important. I predict we will have philosophers and designers in boardrooms and political parties and social movements, much more than we have today. Yeah. Uh, so saying uh, SCP wants to make you run better. Yeah. That is our uh, guiding star, but it is also a philosophy. What does that mean? What is business outcomes? How can technology help through a platforming way of thinking? How can we serve you to be the innovator? You, the pro protagonist. We are there to make you happen for your Uh, for you to be build meaningful relationships and experiences and manage this experience for that client of yours and the, 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 the consumer, the brand, and as, as I said yeah. before, your products and so Ah, oh, wait, it's a philosophy. So I'm reading the history of Western philosophy to back up my assumptions about are we doing the right thing before we do the thing right. Yeah. yeah? Another book uh, I re read before, and I read it several times, A Brief History of Time, yeah. Stephen Hawking. Yeah. Uh, which is a physics book, but beautifully narrated. Yeah. It's a history of our discovery of if philosophy tackles the questions that are, you know, all the way to metaphysics and beliefs, um, Hawking, through this book, tackles the questions of knowledge and the history of ignorance. We don't know. We discovered that we didn't know. Because before that, we actually thought we knew everything. Yeah. And if we didn't, we left it to the sort of oracles of this world, the organized religions and so on. Oh, this is how it is. Yeah. And someone said, hmm, now we gathered so much knowledge, you cannot, there's no one person on this planet, that was many thousand years ago, uh, that knows everything. Yeah. Wow, we don't have answers. How amazing. This is how science was born. Yeah. So philosophy and science coming together. Another one, two books that I read uh, sort of together was Superintelligence with Bostrom. Because he goes very scientifically or 
at, if not scientifically, he goes very systematically through how artificial intelligence and humans uh, can coexist in the future, together with a book called Life 3.0 from Tegmark, okay. both Swedish for some reason, yeah. uh, that describes the future of Homo sapiens. But, as, and this was my assumption, this is what, what they caught my attention, technology is human evolution. Okay. Fire is a very interesting technology. Yeah. We understood how to tame it so we could eat differently. Yeah. When we did, our brains grew. When they did, we became social animals, not only you know, s s singular animals, which made us... That technology changed everything. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, we won the planet. Yeah. So what is the next thing there? And comes back to the transhumanity, the... Uh, as we call it, is in our vision the empathic symbiosis between machine intelligence, human ingenuity. But I also le uh, uh, read the uh, three other books I would like to mention here is uh, The God Delusion, which is a scientific approach how the brain works when, with belief okay. and what biases we have that, you know, are delusional. Absolutely bananas that we need to observe. Again, listen to yourself. Yeah. As a society as well, how do we misguide ourselves sometimes rather than actually stop, listen, be concerned about the facts, and then build assumptions that are a little bit more educated. So higher value work again. Yeah. Uh, and I read, uh, which was a big hit for me, the three books of Yuval Harari, Homo Deus, Okay. Uh, Sapiens okay. and uh, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Recommend them highly. He's a macro historian. Okay. He's not a technologist. Observe okay. that. But he goes in almost a little bit with a philosophical approach. Hey, if we have Homo sapiens now and we do stuff that today would be seen as godlike, yeah. we, can, we can always question what is life. We can soon create life. We have done that. I mean, Dolly, the cloned sheep, yeah. was one example. Yeah. So, done. We are gods, the Homo Deus. What does that mean? And what would that, from a historical macro, the thousands of years, mean? And he's very sober about it. But then he looks also at the sapiens history, why we are, mm -hmm. the, the, the Homo species that won. Of all the uh, Homo possibles, Homo sapiens was the one that is the only Homo we know. Interesting how, and then he looks why at the problems today. Back to your the fears, yeah. there and so on. And the last one, which almost is dry compared to the other books, but it is so useful, guys. The innovators' dilemma, and the innovators' DNA. Yeah. Uh, Clayton Christensen. It is a couple of decades old, but this guy says, you know, the Kodaks, the Nokia's, the Blackberries of the world, the blockbusters. Why is not SAP and our customers one of these? Why do we actually thrive? Yeah. Uh, how can we put you as this protagonist, as the, you know, your business? And he's a, a professor in innovation and yeah. business. Yeah. So, um, but here comes the beauty, the poetry on it. He's, it's, this is where the drive becomes really intensive and passionate. He says, back to the old design principle where my design background comes in. You know, as I said before, before you do things right, you need to do the right things. Again, you mm. can measure yourself to death. We, we set our KPIs. We have a plan. Yeah. We are stable. Back to our discussion. Yeah. We measure everything and we are really good at it. Yeah. And we're doing well. We're making money like, you know, yeah. like it was for free. Great. So why did we die? It took 10 years. It took 15 years. But we died. Yeah. Why do, were we bought up or irrelevant on the market? Well, because you didn't do the right things. You, innovative, you were innovative in pursuing your already set plans. You were following the wrong KPIs. You didn't measure for that vision. You measure for this execution right now. Where do you want to be? That's the dilemma of innovation. Yeah. But then he makes the book of uh, the DNA. He, again, being a professor and, and a researcher... What are the DNAs of the best innovators out there? And he studied across, you know, Jeff Bezos and all these folks. Yeah. And luckily for us, there are only five things. You question a lot. So listen. Yeah. You observe a lot. Listen again. Yeah. You network. Basically go out of your bubble. Associate ideas that were never compared before. Basically, 
what's the next thing is not the right question because the next thing is the relationship between possibly not comparable things before and you experiment. Yeah. You need to have the courage to take an ouch to learn, to move forward to your next step. These are the only DNAs innovators should have. And that's that, that, that is still in perspiration. It's an old book. People just forgot to read yeah. it again and again and again. Yeah, sometimes old books are still the best. You know, sometimes truth doesn't change. So my last question for you is, um, imagine you could go back in time today mm -hmm. and go to your 20-year-old self. What would you tell him? I think it's, uh, it's, it's been a long story we, uh, we, we have had here for the, our discussion. Um, I'm coming back to, to the dare to experiment. Um, ask more than you give answers. Uh, change your context um, often. And look for emergence, not for stability. Look for evolution. How can you help this? And remember, you are creating the futures. Futures have not happened yet. You are not the consumer of the future. You are the main actor in it. How can you conduct, orchestrate, and fuse it with other people's opinions about it? Best of luck. There's like a beautiful last words. So, Martin, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Indeed. Thank you very much. See you next time, guys. <laughs>